Hallelujah. I'm going to have some study this morning, so you're going to have your Bible very close by and some writing on your part. I want to look at the spirit upon. Hallelujah. The spirit upon. Or his spirit upon both ways, you know. Matthew's Gospel 28, 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All authority that what power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Verse 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Mark's Gospel 16. Mark's Gospel 16, verse 15. And he said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believes not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils, that's what demons. They shall speak with new tongues, verse 18. They shall take up serpents, and we drink any deadly thing, they shall not hurt. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they, the sick, shall recover. Verse 19, so then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up on the heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Verse 20, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord walking with and confirming the word with signs following, amen. Now one more, John 20. And it's going to be our focus, really. And so now we have two references, one added now. John 20, verse 19. Then the same day, at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for the fair of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace unto you. And verse 20, and when he had so said, when, and when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Verse 21, then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me. Even so send are you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, on his itali- them italicized, and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Verse 23, Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. Whosoever sins you retain, he says, they are retained. Now Luke's Gospel, 24, verse 25 to 27. O fools, he says to them, and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Begin at Moses and all the prophets, he, verse 27, expounded unto them in all the scriptures. The word expounded there means to translate, to interpret. In all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Verse 44, then he came and spake to them, saying, These are the words which I said to you, Luke's Gospel 24, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. 45, pay attention. Then opened ye their understanding that they might understand the scriptures, which means to read the scriptures together. Now, if you look at Matthew's Gospel 28, let's just explore it a bit, one by one. In Matthew's Gospel 28, uh, you should have been reading from verse chapter 1. He says in verse 20, lo, I am with you always. And the word I am there, told you is not just a set of pronouns, it is a proper name. I am with you. As he said that, the mind goes to Exodus 3, 6 and 3. I am Yahweh. By my name Jehovah, or Yahweh, was I not known to your fathers, Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am. It's the same word, Avar. I am. What else do we have to look at closely? Now, in Luke's Gospel, again, in Luke's Gospel, just put this together, in Luke's Gospel 25, he said, O fools and slow of heart, bradus kalier, slow of heart, bradus means unyielding. When we say slow here, it means slow, like speed. But the word slow there means unwilling, unwilling. Same word in James 1, 19, be slow to speak, all right, unwilling to speak, swift to hear, slow to speak, okay. So now put that besides Mark 16, 14, so slow of heart, Bradus Kadia, 
B R A D U S. Then Cardia, where you have cardiology, K R D I A. Then you have in Mark 16 14. He rebuked them for their hardness of the heart. Hardness of the heart. That's the word sclerocardian. S K L E R O, sclerocardian, which means hard, unwilling, unyielding to of the heart. Now, Mark had mentioned that in chapter 10, verse 5. Chapter 10, verse 5. And he was referring to the children of Israel in Numbers, or what we can call the Exodus. Chapter 10 and verse 5. For the hardness of the heart, Moses speaks, wrote unto you, you can find that reference in Matthew 19, Verse 3 to verse 8. Hardness of heart. Hardness of the heart. So, just like we said, every time Jesus is teaching that, his words are taken from the Old Testament. Which means that he has seen or he's finding a similarity between the children of Israel who doubted God and his own disciples. O fools and slow of heart, brothers, hardness of heart, sclerocardia. They are descriptions similar to the children of Israel when they left Egypt. Why are we saying that? Because don't forget, Luke 24, 45 says, you must read the scriptures how? Together. That they might understand the scriptures. You read the scriptures together, so near me. Together. To reason together, which means you reason through Genesis to Malachi, reason through the four gospels. Yet again, Mark 1, don't forget, Mark 1, before you get to Mark 16. The synoptic, therefore, is reasoning together with the Old Testament. They're reasoning together with the Old Testament. Which means that the words of the four Gospels are the words of the Old Testament. You reason together. You reason together. The audience have similarities. They're not same in number. They're not same in, uh, but they're same in kind. Okay? They are not the same audience, but they are the same audience in the kind or in the character. Hardness of the heart. Moses will call stiff necked. Alright? So they are the same audience in character, not in number. Alright, so look at Mark 1. What's Mark driving home? And I want you to pay attention to this. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Ake. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, that's Exodus, right? Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Mark references two texts, Malachi 3 verse 1 and Isaiah chapter 40 verse 3. Malachi 3 verse 1. And don't forget, one of the things we've looked at is the fact that the, the prophets were referring to each other. Is that clear? All right, so Malachi 3 verse 1. Malachi 3 verse 1. I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. Who is the messenger? The word messenger here is the word malak. 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 Same word as you read that. Exodus 23 and verse 20. I send an angel, same Hebrew word, before thee to keep thee in the way, to bring thee into the place that I have prepared. Into the place. Okay? Malachi 3 1. To prepare the way before me. Okay? To prepare the way before me. I want you to pay attention to this. Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40, verse 3. The voice of him that cries in the wilderness. Is that the same thing? Okay. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So notice in Exodus, what we first read, that messenger before the, he said to take you to the place. Now, by the time we go to Isaiah, Malachi, is take you to the Lord, the person. So which means that the use of land, right, and the use of place in, earlier on in Exodus or earlier on in Genesis was referring to a person. It's a parable of a person. 
And I think I, I mentioned this to you before, that when in Genesis 17 verse 1, where the Lord said to uh, um, Abraham, I am almighty God. I am almighty God. Genesis 17 and verse 1, I am almighty God. The word Shaddai, Shaddai, S-H-A-D-D-A-Y, means a wide land. A wide land. I am the wide land. I am almighty, the wide land. That is why after that promise, he speaks about the whole earth. I am the wide land. So, look at how each writer developed a, con a concept that was explainable to their world. Moses used land. Isaiah and Malachi, yes, referred to land through the wilderness, but they now pointed to the Lord. Prepare the way of the Lord. Whereas in Exodus, it's the way to the land, the promised land, as we can say today. But Isaiah adds some more. Isaiah chapter 40. Are you following? Are you following? All right, Isaiah chapter 40. The highway for our God, verse 3. Then in verse 5, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, all flesh shall see it together. It says the glory of the Lord. Then in verse 9, O Zion that brings good things, get thee up in the high mountain, O Jerusalem. He uses Jerusalem and he uses Zion. Then he says, behold your God. Jerusalem. Then in Isaiah 52 and verse 7. Isaiah 52 and verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that brings good tidings, that publishes peace, and brings good tidings of good, and publishes salvation, and says to Zion, thy God reigneth. Where do we have Zion? Zion, I told you, geography is important in theology, right? In our knowledge of God, we must pay attention to details. In 2 Chronicles, or sorry, 2 Kings chapter 5, did I say that? 2 Samuel. 2 <laughs> Samuel chapter 5, where we read about Zion, verse 7. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is the city of David, or the city of the king. Zion is found where? In Jerusalem, verse 5 and 6. What does Jerusalem represent? Jerusalem represents, in Joshua chapter 10, verse 1, that city of Melchizedek in Genesis chapter 14, verse 18, which is Melchizedek, who righteousness was first used for before Abraham. Abraham was given righteousness, God's righteousness, all right, in Genesis 15, 6. But Melchizedek was already called the king of righteousness, Genesis 14, verse 8. And the king of peace, Shalom, Jerusalem. So Jerusalem, therefore, is a counter-narrative to the kingdoms of this world. We had Sodom, who fought wars with soldiers. We had Melchizedek, who was a priest, who served as a king. Understand that? So Jerusalem, therefore, is God's answer to human government and kingdoms. Human government and kingdoms work with coercion, power, and violence. God's kingdom is that of peace, Jerusalem. And the priest of, uh, of that kingdom... That is the king, Jesus himself. So, if Mark now, I've mentioned all that earlier in verse chapter 1, the beginning, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Uh, he doesn't just stop there. He says in Mark 1 that, again, so that you get it, uh, John the Baptist, who fulfills that promise or prophecy of the messenger before the Lord, uh, John the Baptist goes to Jordan. Jordan is that border before they go to the promised land. So by going to Jordan, he's saying it's about to happen. Are we about to enter the land? No, we're about to see the Lord. Who's following this now? Is it making sense? Jordan is the parable of the promised land. The promised land, the physical land is a parable. Jordan is a parable. Jordan says we're about to get there. We're about to get, we're about to cross there. So John the Baptist goes to Jordan to say we're about to see who? God. Remember the land was a parable of who? Of who? 
of who? The Lord. So if John the Baptist goes to Jordan, Jordan is a place the children of Israel cross to Canaan. If he goes to Jordan, he simply says, we're about to see who? The Lord. So by baptizing with water, he does what Moses and Joshua did. The people passed through Jordan, they passed through the Red Sea, baptized. And he saw, behold, the Lamb of God that takes the sin of the world away. That's why he came. I came to prepare the way of the Lord, to show you who the Lord is. So without doubt, the synoptic writers were very clear in describing who Jesus was. They use very clear terms to let you see that by using the Isaiah narrative I mentioned earlier, and all we have read so far, they are showing that Jesus is God. God. And that is critical. Don't forget our study is the spirit or his spirit upon. So let's go to John. John John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 1. I think I skipped something. Okay, it's not this service. John's Gospel 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word, Logos in the Greek. Now, according to Luke, every time we see a Word in the Greek, we must go back to the Old Testament, right? Come on. So, does John have a right? Now, I, I did say this because it was important. Years ago, I remember I had this encounter with this Jehovah Wickedness guy, Jehovah Witness. And this guy told me that, no, that Jesus is God's word. is not God. That is God's promise. And, of course, of course, I mean, if you had encounters with them, sometimes they'll give you their own Bibles or use their Bibles. So what I did for him that day was 95, 95 August, I remember, September, sorry. I remember very well. It was, in, it was near Ragulis Waters. <laughs> Ragulis Waters, sorry. <laughs> um, there was a first bank, I think, first bank, then the shop. Because I, I used to sell in the shop then. So he came around and he was bamboozing me. I said, come. So he didn't think I was a Christian like that because my haircut was not what I have now. Let me see who has my kind of air cord. No. Let me see you. No. Let me see you. Move like this a bit. Something similar to this. But mine was a bit more very, very, very obvious. You know, this will go down. And I also put them. Um, I pump my hair. <laughs> so the guy said, he thought I was not a Christian. So I said, you know, bring your Bible, let me give you my own. I knew what I was doing. It was a rookie one, so I just got So I began to say, oh, it's the word God spoke. I said, no. Logos does not mean speech. Logos includes speech. Now, and, and that can be an issue because if you don't understand that, and eventually if you look at their dishonest Bible, the, the, the New World Translation, I have it. That's why I was able to tackle the guy that day. They said the word became a God. It makes sense because when you say a, the words, you know, it means a created being. But if we know very well that John can't be writing on his own, just like Jesus didn't teach anything that he innovated, Jesus taught from the Old Testament. So the word of God, did John just decide to call the word God, or was it like that in the Old Testament? Now, go to Genesis chapter 15. You will have read the statement the, or the word or the phrase, word of the Lord. The word of the Lord. It is the Hebrew word, avar. Did I say avar? Davar, D-A-V-A-R, or dabar, D-A-B-A-R, the same thing. It's used both for a word and a thing. The word, the bar, also implies a living being. Look at Genesis 15. Verse 1. After these things, watch this, the word of the Lord, what? 
Genesis 15 verse 1. I'm waiting for you. After these things, let's go. The word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision saying, the word came speaking. Are you there? Okay. The word came to him speaking. Look at verse 4. The word of the Lord came to him saying. The word of the Lord came to him saying. So he's not referring to just a voice. He's referring to a person. So the word of the Lord, all right, comes and speaks. More than just a phrase. He's a person. The word of the Lord. Let's see other places where you find that phrase, the word of the Lord. Where you have Logos. Look at 1 Samuel 15. There are, several, there are several, though. I just will pick out a few. 1 Samuel 15, verse 10. Then the word of the Lord unto Samuel, then came the word of the Lord to Samuel, saying, so it wasn't meant to just be words. It's a person who came, is that clear? Speaking to Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 7. And verse 4, it came to pass, the word of the Lord came to, you know, have you noticed that they separate the saying from coming? Uh, Diba came saying. Ezekiel 3, and verse 16. Mm -mm. Verse 16. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman. So you have a person came. So God, every time you see the word of God, is God personally present. Speaking. Personally present. You have Jonah. Jonah, Jonah. Several others, though. I don't know why I skipped it. Jonah. Okay, let's see one more. Um, Isaiah 2, verse 1. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw. He saw. So the word, when you say, you can see the word. Diba is what is also seen, is what is heard, and what is seen. So I said, go to Jonah. I was going to see. Okay, you have Joel 1 1 2, Joel 1 1. Jonah. Chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go. Jonah 3, 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise and go. So the word, Zechariah, let's say Zechariah 1, 1, 2. The second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Agai the prophet. Unto Jeroboam the son of uh, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people, this time is not come, the time of the Lord. So you have then verse 3, then the word of the Lord by Agai the prophet, saying. So the word of the Lord represents his person, God's personal experiences with people. So John says, the word became what? Flesh. That was not the first time God would personally interact with men. But this time the word became a human being. Let me see how you're following this. 
Is it very clear? The word became a human being and dwelt amongst us. So look at John. The word became, for the beginning was the word. Let's start with that. The word was with God and the word was who? Is that clear now? Is that the same Daba? So the word speaking through the prophets was God himself, right? Come on. Was God himself. And I told you the idea of God being away from the earth is not in the Bible. Where people now die when they are old and then go and meet God outside the earth. It is not in the Bible. Where you have the word of the Lord, that is God present, personally speaking. It's not in the Bible. Now, am I saying that people don't die and go to God? I didn't say that. But I'm saying that the idea of God living elsewhere or being elsewhere outside the earth is not biblical. The word of the Lord, the Daba, is both for a word and also a theme. It can be heard, it can be seen. So when John says in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God, he lets us know that the things that we read, God speaking to men, was personal. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him. Without him was anything made that made. It was made in him was life. The light was life of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness couldn't comprehend it. But let's quickly go to verse 14. And the word was made flesh. The word was made flesh. The word made there is ginomai. Ginomai. It means to exist in a form. It's not to start existing. Let me give you uh, an example. Revelation 1. When you say all things are passed through, for example, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, all things are become, become. It's not the beginning of existence. It is the beginning of existence in a form. Now, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10. Watch this now. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. That's the word ginomai. I was simply meant he was, he had visions and revelations. That's what he's talking about. I was. Or I switched location from just seeing mountains to seeing things in the spirit. That's all. So the word started existing as a man. Became flesh. Was made flesh. Was made flesh. The word was made flesh, means kinomai, was made flesh, and dwelt among us. Look at the word dwelt. It's a verb. It's a verb that means tabernacle. Revelation 715. 715. He that sits on the throne shall dwell among them. Revelation 12, verse 12, the verb. He that dwell in them. Revelation 13, verse 6. And his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Pay attention to that, 13, verse 6. His tabernacle. Revelation 21, verse 3. Again, you see, this is John, right? It's John's writing. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. Skino, S-K-E-N-O-O. So, the word dwell there is used for tabernacle. And so, John, writing from the Old Testament, says, Logos sax genito kai esconesin, that is, that Logos, Diba, has now become 
a tabernacle amongst us. Which means, he's saying the word doesn't come. The word has now been made flesh. You know what we're saying? The word, be, the word came to them. The word came to them. The word has now become. It is not coming. The word has now become. Logos sacks, that's the word flesh. Eginito kai eskenosen. And a mind kai, you know, let's leave that for another day. <laughs> it means that he put together words of the Old Testament. And it says the word of the Lord that came. Moses built a tabernacle. Then a temple was built by Solomon. Pay attention here. He's saying that word, all right, is the reason for the tabernacle. And that tabernacle built in the Old Testament is the reason for the incarnation of Christ. Incarnation is a modern word. It simply means to change state and become a man. So the word kino confers very easily on Jesus, without doubt, that this is God dwelling amongst men. Now look at the, let's look at the noun, skin, S-K-E-N-E, S -K -E -N -E, Matthew 17, verse 4. Matthew 17, verse 4. This is Peter. Let us make these tabernacles, three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Three tabernacles. Same thing, Mark 9, 5. And Luke 9, 33, tabernacle. Now, very precisely, Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 3. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 3. Verse 2, sorry for that. A minister of the sanctuary... Of the what? True tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. The one that Moses built, a man built it. This one, it says, God built this. Verse 5. When Moses was about to build the tabernacle, God said, make sure you build it according to pattern. So Moses' tabernacle was a type. It wasn't the true tabernacle. Verse 5. Verse 9. Sorry, chapter 9, verse 2. Look at it, verse 1. Then verily the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and worldly sanctuary. There was a tabernacle made the first. Now, I mentioned this in the first service, that the building of a house for gods and idols had been existing before God gave them that instruction. That was in their culture. So the use of building a physical house for God was God coming down to their level. All right? But that was not the plan. It wasn't the purpose. God has no place he has built. He has men he has built. We'll see that as we proceed. So that the concept of having a physical house for God is a concept, a, a human-made culture that God borrows as a parable to teach his word. Don't forget this. That is why the writer of Hebrews says it's a worldly sanctuary. Physical. It has ordinance of divine services, but a worldly sanctuary. Hence, in Hebrews chapter 9, it says in verse 8, the way unto the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was standing. That is, while it was yet standing, it was clear that this was not the tabernacle. It wasn't the tabernacle. It was meant to be a pattern. Hebrews 9, verse 8. Of course, Hebrews 9, 3 as well. Hebrews 9, 11. Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect what? Tabernacle. Not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Which means that, as the writer of Hebrews was writing, he wanted them to look at the tabernacle. Verse 21. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle, that's Moses, and the vessels of ministry. Hebrews 11, 9. By faith, he sojourned, Abraham now, in the land of promise, 
as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Now, Hebrews 13 and verse 10. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought unto the sanctuary by the high priest for sin was born without the camp. Verse 11. Sorry, I wanted to read verse 10. We have an altar where of they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. So, when John was written, writing, sorry, the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, all right, he meant that the word of the Lord, all right, has now found a tabernacle. The word of the Lord, who is God himself, has now found a tabernacle. Don't forget, the word of the Lord refers to God's personal experiences with the patriarchs and the believers of the Old Testament. Don't forget that. So, again, Revelation 13, verse 6, we said, we read that earlier, Revelation 15, verse 5, Revelation 21, verse 3. So, when John, go back to John, the word became flesh, it means the word, that logos of God that speaks, right, that interacts, right, that, come on, that talks, that living being of God has now become a man, and dwelt or tabernacled amongst us. So, what else does John say? John says, we beheld his glory. I wanted to give you the compound Greek words there, but I'll do it next week. Uh, someone should remind me so I won't forget because it's in this note. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We beheld his glory. Now look at that key word, only begotten. Now, <laughs> you know, as a, oh, I'm trying to say it in a way that you will feel good and you won't feel bad. Now when you say only begotten, today's language, it simply means the only child that you have. So we say, in the four Gospels, Jesus is the only begotten child. But, in the epistles, he has brought many sons to glory. That's fine. But, not exactly the full meaning of that. That makes sense. It's true. But, there's more. Amen. <laughs> now, in John 1, when John uses the word begotten, there are two words there, monogenes, M-O-N-E-G-E-N-E-S. Now, oftentimes, when you use the word genus, all right, that word doesn't mean to give birth to. No. It's taken from another word, genos, G-E-N-O-S. Genoa is what means to produce. Genoa means to produce. But genos doesn't mean to produce. Let's see what it means. Or doesn't only mean to produce. Let me make it safer. Matthew 13, so... We said monogenes is mono and genos. All right? So look at the word only. Mono simply means only. Only. So if I read it in today's language, the only begotten son, that means the only child. No. Look at that word again. Very critical. Genos. G E N O S. Matthew 13 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every genos. Can you see it? Kind. Matthew 17, 21. How be this genos goeth not out but by prayer and fasting? Are you following? Are you following? Mark 7, 26.
Mark 7, 26. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by Genos. Can you see it? Nation. Mark 9, 29, this kind goeth not. Kind, Genos. So it's used for a nation, right? All right? A distinction. Is that very clear? Who's following this? Very good. Acts 4, 6. Annas the high priest, and Cephas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as of the kindred, Genos, the kindred of the high priest, kindred. Acts 7.13, Joseph's kindred. Acts 7.19, same deal subtly with our kindred. Acts 13.26, The stock of Abraham, kindred, same thing. Acts 17, 28. For we are his offspring. We are the offspring of God, kind. Acts 18, verse 2. Aquila born in Pontus, born. Acts 18.24 Born at Alexandria. Okay. Galatians 1.14 Paul My own nation. Nation there is the word genos. Nation. Philippians 3 verse 5 Philippians 3 verse 5 Philippians 3 verse 5, of the stock of Israel, stock of Israel. 1 Peter 2, 9, chosen generation, kind. Revelation 22 and verse 16. Now go to 1 Corinthians 12. I left it deliberately. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 10. To another, the, the workings of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the sign of spirits, to another kind of tongues. Genos. A kind of tongues. Distinct way of speaking. Then 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28. The word diversity is there, also is kind of tongues. 1 Corinthians 14, 10. Many kinds of voices. Many kinds of voices. 1 Corinthians 14.10 The 2 Corinthians 11.26 2 Corinthians 11.26 Countrymen. Countrymen. So let's go back to John 1. And we beheld his glory. Okay. The glory as of the <laughs> Look at it. Only what? Kind of God of the Father. Which means is saying to us what we call the Trinity is God. Is that clear? Is that clear? Let me see if you understand it. Come on. Is it clear? Is that clear? Kindred with God. So when you read John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. His only begotten son. We'll see about later. One minute, please. Monogenes, sorry. So John, in John 1, 18, or John 1, 14, he says, we beheld his glory. Now let's look at that word beheld. John 1.32 I bore record saying I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove. I saw. Verse 
John 3 verse 4. Mm -mm. John 1.34. I'm sorry for that. John 1.34. I saw and bore record. I saw. John 4.35. Look on the fields. Lift up your eyes and look on the fields. So the word saw so far is not just physical sight. It is actually to be able to discern, to know, to know according to scriptures. John 6 verse 5, he saw a great company come to him, physical sight. John 8 verse 10, saw none but the woman. John eleven forty five. John eleven forty five. Seeing the things that Jesus did. So when he says we beheld his glory, all right, John is saying we have seen God. Why? Isaiah chapter forty. Forget, I told you to pay attention to that, that Isaiah. Isaiah 40. Verse 5. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Let's take verse 9 together and slowly. Let's go. O Zion, I'll wait for you, Isaiah 40. Let's go. O Zion, that brings... Good tidings. Get thee up in the high mountain, O Jerusalem, that brings good tidings. Lift up thy voice with strength. Lift up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. So, Jerusalem and Zion are used for a person. Can you see it? All right. Come on. Is that clear? Jerusalem and Zion. Say, Behold, say now, say to them, Behold your God. Now, is this what John meant by we beheld his glory? Huh? Come on. That is the kind of God. So John 1 18, yet again. For no man had seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, we'll come back to him in a moment. He has declared him. The word bosom is the word corpus. It simply means something that is close to your chest. It's used for the breast pocket, for example. It's used for something close to your chest. That you see it together. Something you see together. So he said, he had declared him. The word declared, exegomai, E-X-E-G-E-O-M-A-I, E-X-E-G-E-O-M-A-I, is used for a personal story. A personal story. All the prophets spoke for God. But this is an exegomai. You talking about yourself, yourself. Luke's Gospel 24, verse 35, to declare. Luke's Gospel 24, verse 35. He told the things that were done in the way. Sorry. Acts 10, 8. Acts 10, 8. Acts 15, verse 12 and 14. Acts 10, 8. Acts 15, 12 and 14. Acts 21, verse 19. So this is God telling his own story. Is that very clear? Let me see if you're following this. His own story. So this is a kind of God. Only kind of God. We have mankind, we have God kind. This is God kind. Now it says, John 1 18, only begotten monogenes. Let's follow that word all over again. Luke 7 12. Luke 7 12. So, 
Only begotten, we have separated only and begotten. Now let's put it together. Only begotten, Luke 7, 12. Let me, let me go over what I just did now for you. I separated the words for you. Mono is only. All right, that's simple, single. Then genos is what we went through. All right? Because we separated the words. Now, let's put it together and see how it is used. Luke 7, verse 12. The only son of his mother only son of his mother. Luke 8.42 Fire to a child. 8.42 Only daughter. Child. Luke 9.38 Only child. So, in John, John 1.14 Only begotten. John 1.18 Then John 3.16 You knew that before you got saved. Gave his only begotten son. So, I say, so precious. How can you have one son and give him away? John 3.16. John 3.18, the name of the only begotten son of God. John 3.18. All right. First John 4.9. 1 John 4, verse 9. John's writings. 1 John 4, verse 9. In this was manifested the love of God towards us because God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Now pay attention to one very critical use of it. Hebrews eleven seventeen. Hebrews eleven seventeen. Slowly, let's see it. By faith, I want us to read this together. Hebrews eleven seventeen. 17. Yeah, there's amen. <laughs> I'll wait for you. Let's go. By faith, uh -huh, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received promises offered up his only begotten. 18. Of whom it was said, that in Isaac shall thy seed so, is Isaac the only child or the only kind? You see it now? The only kind. Because he had Ishmael. But Isaac was by the promise of the Spirit. So, it's for a kind. Kind. So, when we say the only begotten Son of God, it's a kind. It's unique to Christ. Why? Because it's the Daba that became a human being. In our own case, sinners became sons. Our own kind. Hallelujah. <laughs> is that very clear? Do you, does, does it make sense? Uh -huh. Now, we have done the study on the word son, right? Hoyos, right? An heir, your reflection. One who carries your identity and your office. That's why a whole nation was called son. The whole nation. And when you also so call unbelievers sons of the devil, it doesn't mean that the devil gave birth to them. It means they are reflecting who? The devil. Is it making sense now? Aha. Uh -huh. Well, it's the same thing. I give birth to them somehow. <laughs> so, the Daba of the Old Testament is God as God. All right? The Daba in the four Gospels is God in man. So which means that he will actively do what he did in experiences. You know, he will come to them. He came. He came to them. Which shows that, you know, it was experientially. But now, the Daba, the Logos, has become a person. Living, no, sorry, I take that back. A human person. So the Daba is now a human person. So which means that everything God said he will do, he does it personally. I will bless you, you'll be a blessing, personally. Your seed shall inherit the earth, he's doing it personally. 
He has taken the form of his own promises. Let me see if you understand that. He is father. He says, you are father of many nations. A promise he made to walk through Abraham and is that father. Okay, I will give you a son. The word of the Lord came. He is that white land. Almighty God. Ava, I will be what I'll be. So he is the fulfillment of all he has said. So the truth is this. When to understand the Trinity, as we say it today, I don't like using that phrase, uh, but the reason why I use it is so that you understand what I'm talking about. Father, Son, Spirit, not in any particular order, you see it from God's promise of redemption. Father, Son, Spirit. All in one community of a person reflecting God's purpose and plan in the earth. Pay attention. So in Matthew 28 verse 20, when Jesus says, I am with you always. I am with you always. Therefore, will help us, though I have always disagreed with this concept, but maybe I will grudgingly accommodate it in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Because by saying, I am with you, he's simply saying the I am is Father, Son, and Spirit. With you always. And we know that when Jesus said that, he was referring to the Spirit. Matthew 28, verse 20. Ego am I meth I mon. I am with you. So, pay attention now. In the Old Testament, the word of the Lord, Father, Son, and Spirit. In the epistles, the word became flesh. And we beheld the only kind, the Son. And then it says here, pay attention. No, I am with you always. How? How is he with you always? We are not going to behold him like John said. No. We are not going to behold him. That experience of seeing him physically was with his apostles. Or those that were in Jerusalem with him. But we have something far greater. He said, I am with you. Always. For before, for when the Dava came to them, it was still experiential in the four Gospels. But in the resurrection, it's not just experiential, it's a residence. I am with you always. So the epistles which we are going to see will describe this as the Spirit of God, Spirit of the Son, Spirit of Christ, Spirit of Jesus, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, all of that we'll see later. So John said, we behold his glory, and John is referring to the sin of the... Paul wouldn't say that, because Paul could not have used those words as Paul was not there. John uses that word, beheld him ourselves. Paul doesn't use that word. John does. 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, that which was at the beginning. 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, our hands have handled the word of life. Our hands have Handled. So we looked upon him with our eyes, our hands. Paul won't say this. First John 1 1. Paul can't say this. How is he going to say? It? He can't say this. Who else makes this claim? Second Peter chapter 1. Peter makes this claim. Verse 15, 16. We have not followed cunning device fables when we made known unto you the power and commonology where I witnesses of his majesty. Paul cannot say this. We receive from God the Father honor and glory. There came such a voice unto him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This is eyewitness. Paul cannot say this. Eyewitness. And Luke's, Luke's story is also taken from the eyewitness. Luke 1, verse 3, or verse 2. Even as delivered from all them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. So the eyewitnesses, we beheld his glory. 
What's John talking about? John is talking about the experiences with Jesus in the synoptic. But don't forget, in those experiences, sometimes they were away from him. He was away from them. Are you following? Eyewitness. Because in an eyewitness, you have to be physically present there. There are eyewitnesses. But in the resurrection, they were not just going to be eyewitnesses. They were going to be spirit witnesses. Spirit witnesses. So, Paul doesn't make those claims. Paul, that's why the writer of Hebrews shouldn't be Paul. Now, don't, let's get into a fight on that one. Hebrews 2, verse 1, Therefore, we ought to give the more energy to things we have heard, lest at any time we let them sleep. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, that every transition of Jesus' brilliance should be just coming up with the word, how shall we escape? Even the great so great salvation, which at first began to be spoken to us by the Lord. All right? And confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Confirmed unto us by them. God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders. So which means that it was confirmed by the, those who were physically present. Hebrews 2 and 3. I almost contradict myself now. <laughs> Hebrews 2 and 3. So Paul is not an eyewitness. Paul saw Jesus in the resurrection. Not in the synoptic. All the other apostles saw him tabernacling in the flesh. They saw it. So in John 20, don't forget Matthew 28, verse 20. Lo, I am with you always. Is that the same as the four Gospels? Huh? I didn't hear you. No. I am with you. That phrase, in the I am of God, is capable of being a man, right? Right? All right. And also dwelling with us. He said, no, I am with you always. Matthew 20, 20. So in John 20, don't forget we're looking at the spirit of porn. John 20. So before now, the word of the Lord came, right? At instances, right? Come on. We'll come to them, show them, talk with them. And that God, it was like visiting them. A visit. A visit. I'm using a very loose term, but then allow me. A visit. So in John 20, John 20, we read that earlier. Verse 17, this is Mary Magdalene. And Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, and go to my brethren. I say not unto them, I send to my Father, and your Father to my God. I, I, I mean, I remember uh, I, I used to preach this as, Don't touch me. Because when the high priest is going into the holiest of all, you don't touch it. So one day, I was studying the Greek of this. Then I saw the Greek meant, don't touch me any longer. That means she had touched him. Sacrifice has spoiled. <laughs> you know, <laughs> when I was saying that, I know the implication of that nonsense. Don't talk to me any longer. That means go and tell them something. I ascend to my father and your father. He says, to my God, your God. Pay attention. And Mary Magdalene went and told disciples, and of course, this was the very first apostle. Some guys don't like what I'm saying, but that's their business. She sent to the apostles. Why did Jesus rebuke the apostles? Because they did not believe who he sent. They are wondering, if Jesus is going to give us a why should he send a woman? In their world, the woman was not a credible witness. God does a counterculture. In the new creation, there is no gender. There is no gender. In the new creation. I told them in the first service, we do not discriminate ethnic groups, but we do not subsume the gospel under any. No gender. There are still people today who are fighting vigorously that women should not preach. I told when I said, go and read Women of God. Say, I don't have time to read things like that. Explain this verse straightforward. Say, which verse? 
Paul was clear. He said, a woman must not teach for Timothy 2. I suffer not the woman to usurp authority. I said, ah, okay. I said, but you see, I want us to have a wholesome study. He said, no. Straightforward. What is Paul saying? I said, okay. Can I quote Greek? He said, if I understand it. So I showed him that the word Greek, the Greek there of Jesus is one that carries arms to fight. He said, eh? Yes. Ah. So, if you want to apply literally, you are saying, I don't allow the woman to bring out a gun against her husband. He said, ah. Can that be what he meant? So can we go to the wholesome doctrine? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, people really don't want you to explain scriptures in detail, but later in life, it haunts them. I've seen women, for example, who used to preach the gospel, and they were, they were great ministers of the gospel. They have stopped now. You know why? Because they exposed their heart to the wrong doctrine. Hallelujah. To the wrong doctrine. A woman cannot be ordained to ministry. Woman cannot pastor. Woman cannot. I used to think like that too. Because I was confused. Now, why would Paul write 1 Timothy 3? First thing, a bishop must be a husband. That's very clear. So, without being a husband, you're not a bishop. But, ah, Paul, you're not married now. Neither was Timothy. Oh, our Lord Jesus Christ. Eh, you know, exception to the rule. Ah. He must have children. How are those who don't have children? Hallelujah. <laughs> so sometimes you have to pay attention to details. Is that very clear? All right. So Jesus sent a woman deliberately. So when he said, all fools, no of her, to believe the woman. So today, when you see people that don't want to believe a woman preaching, it says Sclerocardia Braduscadia. <laughs> Hallelujah. Sclerocardia Braduscadia. Say, what do you mean? Come. <laughs> Hallelujah. Are you in church? So John 20. And then Jesus came to them. Now notice something that is sequential here. I'm just going to go through this for you very briefly. John 21, the first day of the week. John 20 verse 1, first day of the week. An emphasis is there, first day of the week. Then John 20, verse 19. The same day at the evening, being the first day of the week, Jesus did everything the same day. Why? I told you time, geography is important in theology. Day is a symbol. That means a new creation has started. In the new creation, male and female will preach and represent God's, God's word and his kingdom. And in this new creation, it says, peace unto you, shalom. Eren in the Hebrew, in Greek, sorry, shalom in the Greek. Then it says, peace unto you. Then in 21, don't forget the way John summarizes the events. John has summarized 40 days events. This is going to help us as we study further. As my father has sent me, even so send I you. As my father has sent me, even so send I you. The word there is the word, pay attention, apostello. Luke 4, 18. He has sent me to preach. Luke 4, 18. He has sent me to preach. Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has sent me to preach. Now I want you to pay attention to John 5, precisely. John 5, 36. John 5, 36. I need you to understand that word sent. John 5, 36. I do bear witness of me 
so, oh, sorry, bear witness of me, and the Father has sent me. The Father has sent me. John 5, 36. I skip John 3, 17. For God sent not his Son into the world. John 3, 17. John 3, 34. He whom God has sent speaks the words of God. This is for Jesus again. John 3, 34, 34 John 3, 17. John 5, 38. For whom he has sent, him you believe not. John 6, 29. John 6, 29. John 6, 29. This is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. John 6, 57. The living father has sent me. John 7, 29. I am from him and he has sent me. John 8, 46. Sorry, 42. But he sent me. John 10, 36. Say ye of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world. Acts 3, 26. Very key. Acts 3, 26. Unto you first, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him, Apostello, to bless you. Okay? As my father has sent me. So, so far, the sending we have seen has to do with, have you noticed, forgiveness of sins. Who has observed that? The work of redemption. As my father sent me to save. I'll take the text again for you. Luke 4, 18, John 5, 36, John 3, 17 and 34. John 5, 38, John 6, 29 and 57, John 5, 36, okay, 1 John 4, 9, 1 John 4, 9, I skipped that earlier, John 7, 29, John 8, 42, John 10, 36, Acts 3, 26. So, as my Father has sent me, so send I you. Pay attention here. The second send is not the same one. It's the word pempo. P-E-M-P-O. It means to put you in the stead. Same way the Father sent me, I will now put you in the same shoes. Is that very clear? Is that very clear? Same way the Father sent me to redeem the world, to save the world, I put you in the same shoes. I know you're not going to the cross, so calm down. Hallelujah. <laughs> I put you in the same shoes. Identification and union. Then when he has said this, now look at how John summarizes it. What is in verse 21 is like a series of teaching. Right? <laughs> he just summarizes it for you. That's why he gives you a caveat. He gives a caveat in verse 25 of chapter 21. There are many other things that Jesus did which if they be written everyone, I suppose even the world cannot contain it. He has given you a caveat that summarizes my words, okay? Is that very clear? So when he says that Jesus said to them, Luke said, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, is that very clear? He expounded unto them in all the scriptures. Luke said he did this, Acts 1, 2, 3, for 40 days. John summarized it by saying, as the Father sent me, even I put you in that shoe. Temple. Verse 22. And when he had said this to them, he breathed on. The word emphasal. Now it doesn't mean that he put his nose on them, and it's no strange. I go, mm -mm. you are reading the Old Testament again. Enfusau here is the same very word, very word 
in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, when man was made, and God breathed into his nostrils the bread of life, the, the breath of life. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Napash, N-A-P-H-A-C-H. N-A-P-H-A-C-H. It means to make active, to make functional. You see that word again in Ezekiel 37, verse 9. Ezekiel 37, verse 9. You need, to, you need to read the entire Ezekiel 37 to understand this well. You know, it, it took him to a valley of dry bones, all right? Then he said, shall these dry bones leave? said, Lord, you know. <laughs> then verse 5, I will cause breath to enter, verse 5 and verse 9, both. I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall leave. Verse 9, O breath, breathe, breathe upon this slain that they may what? Leave. So emphasis is to come alive inside. It's not to put your nostrils on someone's head, which means that when Jesus finished teaching them, they became born again. Is that clear? Is that clear? Come on. Is that okay? They became born again. So, he said, Unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. So two things will put us in the stead of Christ. One, we're born again. Is that clear? Who's following this? All right, we're born again. And for Sao, or the word Napash. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. So how do we fulfill the role of Jesus in the earth? As my father has sent me, even so I put you in the same ministry. Is that clear? Come on. Tempo. How is it going to happen? When he had finished teaching them that, then they got born again. Emphasize. Just like Adam, Genesis 2, 7, and that army, the dry bones in Ezekiel 37, verse 5 and 9. Receive, then he says, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. So look at 23. Let's take 23 together. Oh, you're not there. John 20. Am I a bit fast? No. I reject being fast in Jesus' name. Every spirit of being fast. Stay. All right. John 20, 23. Go, let's go. Whosoever sins you, I what? Whosoever sins you, retainer. Come on. Why would he say that to people? Huh? Human beings. <laughs> As my father has sent me, I put you in the same shoe. Remember what God said to Abraham. Whosoever blesses you, I'll bless. Whosoever accepts you, accepts your message, accept. Whosoever rejects your message, I'll reject it. Hallelujah. Is that very clear? Is it making sense? All right. So, there's life within John 20 again, 21, 22. Then he says, receive ye the Holy Ghost. What do we receive ye the Holy Ghost? The word there is lambano. To take. To seize. Lambano. L-A-M-B-A-N-O. To seize. So the spirit is within. Come on. Is the spirit within? Are you sure? By the word emphasize, the spirit is where? Within. So he says now take. Take of the Holy Ghost. Now where is the Holy Ghost? Within. Take of the Holy Ghost. And whosoever sins you remit, are remitted. Whosoever sins you retain, doesn't mean you say in your room and say, I remit Shagun sins now. I don't like Shagun. I retain his sins. No. <laughs> it's a statement of preaching. We're going to explore it also. So Acts 1.8, you shall receive power 
after which the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. Luke 24, 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father, the same word Apostolo, upon you. So when you read the book of Acts, you see the word receive of the Holy Ghost. I'm just going to give you the text. We'll look at it next week. Acts 2, 38 and 39, Lambano. Acts 8, 15, Lambano. Acts 9, 17, Paul will receive the Holy Ghost, Lambano. Acts 10, 45, in the house of Cornelius, Lambano. Acts 19, 2, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? In every instance, it was an experience after the new birth. Acts 2, 38 and 39. Acts 8.15, they were already saved. Acts 9.17, same as Paul. Acts 10.45, the house of Cornelius. Acts 19.2. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you have already believed? Now Paul assumed they had believed. So by that conversation, he found out they had not believed. So he now taught them the gospel. Verse 3 and 4. Then verse 5, they were baptized in the name of the Lord. Verse 6, he now laid his hands on them. And the Holy Ghost, what? Came on. Put all those references somewhere. So what is the spirit upon? The spirit upon to us today is a function of being born again. It's an experience that happens because you are born again. Let's see the genesis of that word very quickly. Our time is going very quickly. Numbers chapter 11. When I say upon, again, use Bible language for Bible words. Is that clear? Is that very clear? Is it clear to you? Aha. Uh -huh. Don't use. When I say upon, I remember when, uh, uh, particularly, and many, many of us, and that's the strength of information. Many of us, myself inclusive, we studied, one of our first Bible studies in my life was reading Jehovah's Witnesses' book. Jehovah's Wickedness, we called them. And I remember that the page they used for the day of Pentecost, on the head, you had fire. That view has never left me. Till now I'm seeing it. You know, every time you are studying Genesis, you keep saying, Shh. it's such an, and that was because from a child, that was known you were witness. <laughs> it has made this cool in it. So it's, is, you know, if you look at many of you are battling these simple things, it's because of that book. We have to get the word of God out. Of I'm telling you. And I'm not joking at this. We need to really get God's word out. People have been brainwashed. As I'm speaking to you, I'm still seeing it. I'm telling you. Oh, God, save me right now. So when you say upon, you think it's someone's head. It's Bible language, oh. Hallelujah. I'm going to spend extra time in this service. So third service will have to wait a bit. Numbers 11. Because I want to get this, out, this one out to you before we finish this service. Numbers 11. Are you there? Bible words, right? All right, for Bible words. Numbers 11. Verse 16. Now, what was the background? Moses said to God, I can't bear this responsibility alone. I cannot. I can't handle this alone. And God said, okay. In verse 16, gather unto me 70 men of the elders of Israel. I mentioned that in the first service. I've taught you this before. 70. Why were they using 70? Now, some people have argued that that 70 is because um, those who entered Egypt were 70. No. They are represented as 12 tribes. You see that in Exodus 1 5. But the 70 were the 70 nations in, Num in Genesis chapter 10, showing you that the reason God chose Israel is to preach his word in all the earth. 70. So it says to 70 elders who will stand with you. Look at 17. I will come down and talk with thee and will take the spirit which is upon you and put it upon them. So the word upon is used for responsibility. To bear responsibility. To take on the work off. Or to, for the work off. 
to be with you. Now look at what happened. Just like that in 25, the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke unto him and took of the three that is upon him and gave to the 70 elders. It came to pass, let's take verse 25 together, when the Spirit rested upon where? Them. Uh -huh. They prophesied and did not cease. So the very first time we'll see that word upon is to what? To what? Prophesy. The word upon in the Hebrew there is the word A-L. For you or on your account. On your account. Where are we going to see that? Genesis 1-2. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon. We were seeing darkness. Activities. The spirit of God moved upon. The activities. So the word upon is used for activity. Is that very clear? Is that very clear? Come on. Is that very clear? So spirit upon is activity that will be seen. So in Numbers 11, it says it rested on them. Nuach, N-U-A-C-H. A word used later on for God's resting place. To rest upon. But notice something very unique here. And this is where King James might confuse you. And when the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. Are they still prophesying? No. The word did not cease there means, is the word yasaf. It means again or add. So, they prophesied and not again. <laughs> The exact opposite. <laughs> that means he prophesied how many times? Once. Is that very clear? Uh -huh. Not again. They did not continue. Then, the word prophesied is taken from prophet. The word prophesied simply means to be God's spokesperson, to speak on his behalf. To take God's word and show to the people from the word Nabai, N-A-B-I. You see it in Genesis 27 for Abraham, Exodus 7, 1 for Aaron on behalf of David, of, of Moses. So when we say spirit upon, it means for men, I'll close here, to see the activities of God through a man. It's not on his head. Upon simply means we see God's activities. So it's not on your head. At the new bath, the Holy Ghost begins to live in us. And he produces experiences upon us. Is that very clear? Is that very clear? And that experience is to stand in the very ministry of Jesus Christ in the earth today. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. And the word upon refers to utterances, right? To say things. Not just that. We're going to see it. It also means to see things by the Spirit. So everyone that is born again can have experiences of speaking and seeing things by God's Spirit. Anybody born again here? Anyone like that? God the Holy Ghost. Amen. God the Holy Ghost. So what is the Spirit upon? To take from the Spirit and minister to others. We'll continue from here next week. You blessed? Stand to your feet and just give God praise. Lift your hands. Bless him.